Okay, morning everyone. Um, yeah, I'm sorry uh, uh, those who are here on Zoom are here, uh, but uh, I prefer today to do it, uh, uh, speak from home. Uh, so I sent a message, uh, an email, it's only by Zoom. I hope uh, you guys have seen it. Okay. Um, so let's start off with a Dvar Torah, as usual, and then uh, Dr. Weiss had a question he wants to ask about Hilchos Tefillah, and then we'll continue our Hilchos Shabbos course. Okay, so um, Parshas Korach, you read, is obviously uh, one of the more difficult Parsha, Parshas of uh, Sefer Bamidbar, as we know, uh, uh, many, many uh, downfalls and uh, sinful acts in the desert uh, after the Chet Ameraglim. They, they spent the 40 years there, and uh, at the moment uh, you're not, the person isn't uh, uh, pleased uh, with the situation, and he finds all kinds of ways to express it. So that's how we have so many... Uh, obstacles on the way uh, with uh, uh, seeing the negative, seeing the bad side of things and not appreciating the good. Um, so anyhow, uh, uh, a famous idea uh, brought down in the Parsha uh, by the Malbim. Uh, the Malbim explains that uh, how come Korach uh, and his people uh, or I'll put it this way, based on the uh, Mishnah and Avos, uh, uh, the that's, uh, that, that, that is based on something that, uh, that has a, 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 a good or a positive or a meaningful uh, goal to reach, the Shem Shamayim, you want to find out what the real truth of the matter is, then it's a machlokis that will always exist, forever exist. Whereas if we're talking about a machlokis, it's not Hashem Shamaim, if the dispute is over, uh, over materialistical issues, over uh, uh, non, uh, non-holy issues, so then it's not going to remain. It seems contradictory to what we would thought, we would think that a machlokas Hashem Shamaim should not exist anymore. And after there's the dispute, so with the both, both sides are trying to strive for the truth, the real truth of the matter. So it should reach a point where they complete one another and then end Safalit Kayem. So in the end, there won't be a machlokas. They're all Hashem Shamaim. They'll have the same goal to reach, to, to reach the MS. Where it's uh, where it, it all has to do with uh, personal interests uh, and uh, and to uh, always outdo others, that's something that will no longer exist because it's going to all fall apart. So why is it? Uh, In Sofalit Kayem, meaning it's going to fall apart in a way that they disagree, all, they always continue to disagree with one another, so it's always going to remain. The Machlokis is going to remain. So the Malbim explains the following The Malbim says, firstly, how do we detect that it's a Machlokis Sheina Lashem Shamaim, Kikoach Ve'adato? So we see in that Mishnah that it doesn't say Kikoach Moshe. Those are the two in dispute. Why does it say Kikoach Ve'adato? So it explains the Malbim that really, since they weren't doing the Shem Shamaim, since they weren't uh, striving for the truth, okay, one second, please. Uh, okay. um, since, uh, since it's not, uh, 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 since, yeah, since it's not striving for the truth, to the truth, so they're really disputing one another. Each one within a das korach 
each one of the people there thought they, he was correct. And he was actually competing and disagreeing with the, with the people in his camp. So Koach Vadato were the people who, <coughs> who had the machlokis, they themselves had that machlokis. So that's, uh, and what united them to be all together? Only the fact that they were against Moshe. That's the Lola Shem Shamayim. All they wanted to do is to gain uh, ruling and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, respect for themselves, for each one himself. As we know that uh, it couldn't have happened that the, each one would become the, the Kohen Gadol. With the trial of the, of the Ketoret, that the 250 people had to bring a Ketoret, it couldn't have been that all 250 would have been chosen to be the Kohen Gadol. It had to be <clears throat> only one of them. So they took a risk, such a risk that they would be, uh, they know they would die if they're not the one chosen. But they felt, each one of them felt the pride in himself, the gaava, the boastfulness in himself, to believe that he will, he will win uh, out, of, out of all the others. So that's all disputing one another. Nothing to do with Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't in dispute with them at all. Moshe Rabbeinu strove for the truth. He wasn't looking to be the leader. He wasn't looking for himself. He was appointed by Hashem. He even sent a call for the Tan Aviram at the very, very last moment to try to get them back and try to make peace with them. Even though they did so much harm to him from the very beginning in Egypt. They're the ones that Chazal explained who came out to confront Moshe and Aaron after they had gone to Paro and said, said to them, what have you done? You've made it worse for us. So from the very beginning, they, they threw mud at Moshe and, and Aaron, and they were always uh, fighting them and against them. And even so, Moshe Rabbeinu wants to make peace with them. Because Moshe Rabbeinu is L'Shem Shamayim. He knows uh, that each person does what's meant for him to do and uh, has a role and goal in life according to their neshama, according to their mission in the world. Whereas, Beit Hilelu, Beit Shamayim, Achlokis L'Shem Shamayim, what united, first of all, each camp on its own was L'Shem Shamayim. They didn't try to reach the, they didn't try to win. The Chassam Sofer speaks about this, that when you try to, when you're uh, arguing with a person, if you always want to say the last word, and you always want to be, and you always feel you're, you, ha you have the MS, you have the truth in you, and the other doesn't, then you'll never really gain anything. You'll never reach the point of, uh, uh, the point of uh, perfecting yourself. You always believe, you're always, you're, 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 all, you're always believe in your own self, and you won't listen to anyone else. And that's very bad, says the Hassan Sofer. That's the Natsach. It's not to figure out what the truth is, it's to try to overcome every other opinion and be always, on the right, be always correct in your way, which is definitely impossible and definitely wrong. We're always listening, we're always ready, prepared to listen to other people in order to find... I guess we just lost Ralph Steinberg. Can I ask this? I'm not, I'm obviously on Zoom. Where's the shear taking place? In the shul in the Beit Midrash? 
in his or house. somewhere else. His house today. Ah, because yeah. somebody just went there and asked me. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Rev Steinberg, you're muted. Sorry, okay, sorry for that. I'm disconnected for, 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 for a moment. Um, so the Gemara says in Arabian, the reason Beit Hillel, Allah is like Beit Hillel because they, were, they weren't more sharp than Beit Shammai, but Beit Shammai were more sharp, Hamifim, more sharp than them, but they were more Anavim. They were uh, uh, um, more humble in a way. Uh, and they always allowed Beit Shammai to say their opinion first. It always has in the Mishnah Beit Shai Omrim and then Beit Hillel Omrim. That's this, that's this uh, order in the in the Mishnah. So this is a very very important message that uh, we learned from the Malbim from this week's parsha. Ah, and then the final last point is, um, what does it mean? Machlokitchi l'shem Shamaim sofali tkayem. We said it sounds counter to what we would expect. That if it's in the Shem Shamayim, so in the end there won't be a machlokis anymore. They'll be listening to one another. Why should it remain for always? I remember of Neuvert, Ravonen Neuvert, saying this. I don't know if in the name of someone or his own uh, idea that Safalit Kayem actually means that those two opinions will forever remain in the world because both opinions strived to reach the truth. So both opinions have a uh, benefit, you gain a benefit out of both opinions because they are truthful. So sometimes this opinion is useful, sometimes the other opinion is useful, sometimes bishat atchak, you go by this one, sometimes you're machmir, you have a bracha, if you do chumra, like the other opinion. Uh, so it's all meant to remain because they all had garin emet, they were all based on a seed of truth uh, of Torah, and therefore the, we, we gain from both sides. Whereas, meaning the dispute may forever go on, may forever continue, but the opinions are, we forget, are, are forgotten. They, they, they don't add anything. No, there's no value to the opinion of a person who's only there, who's only expressing his idea, his, his, his uh, position, because he wants to be correct. He wants to be on top. And that's where um, Korach's big mistake was when he says, Kol kulam kedoshim, Hashem. Ke'al Hashem. Eh, we're, all, we're all, all Jews are holy equally, are equally holy. Why are you taking, why are you the leaders? Moshe and Aaron, you took the leadership uh, for yourselves. And the obvious, the obvious answer is, that's true, everyone is holy. Every single Jew is holy, but there are different potentials. And there are those who, 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 who live and act by their potential more so, and those who are less. So true, the, the basis to everything is that we're all one unit, we're all one nation, we're all holy, we're all children of Hashem. But there are different levels. Hashem gave different neshamot to different people. So you can't just say uh, anyone can become a leader. And if one wants to become a leader, he has to work hard to reach, to, to exercise his potential and bring it out to the open. So that takes a lot of uh, effort and not uh, just a saying like that. And definitely not coming from a person who is only looking for leadership and not building himself up towards leadership. That's... Uh, that's the message that connects to all that we've said now. And uh, we hope that uh, in these days, these days are very, very challenging from all sides, from all from different, from all different directions. And uh, we hope that uh, this message is very clear to anyone in leadership, in politics, <coughs> to realize that no one has the ultimate truth in their party in there as an individual or as a party. Uh, we have to try to listen to one another and not always feel that we're right, that we're correct. 
and win over, try to win, the, to try to beat the other side, rather than listen carefully to each camp, to each party, and try to make a, 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 a to make a resolution, you reach a resolution that includes all different uh, opinions from all sides. Uh, problem is that uh, the way it works in politics is that uh, after all, there are those in the coalition, and there are those in the opposition. And uh, to include everyone together from all different types to have a say, to give a say and to, and to uh, respect one another from all different parties and all different types, that's impossible. That's only if the entire Knesset would have been the government. But it's not so. We have equal camps on both sides. And uh, by the virtual virtue of, uh, of, of being the opposition, so you're against. In the coalition, you're for. And then uh, there ought, has to be uh, disputes in a way that you're trying to gain control. And that's wrong. Disputes can't come from a place of gaining control. They have to come from a place that you express your opinion, you listen to the other side, and together we reach a, a mutual uh, uh, um, inclusive, inclusive way from all different parties. It's very, very, very difficult. That's what we need the Mashiach for, actually. The, one, the only one that can really make all this work out and have a vision that includes all different parties. Uh, and I really mean all, all different parties, uh, at least in the Jewish, uh, of, of, of the Jewish parties, uh, that we really need the uh, different views <clears throat> of all the sides and to be, to be able to listen to one another. And only then can it really lead to uh, a, an ultimate truth that is in inclusive of all different opinions. Without Hashem, we'll just bless, uh, bless ourselves and our nation and our country that uh, whoever we'll be ruling for these coming years uh, will have this type of uh, concept in their mind uh, to be as inclusive as possible, to be as uh, cooperative as possible and respectful as possible to everyone. And then the leadership will really be a good one for the Jewish people. And uh, always remember that Hashem is on top of everything. He gavoa me'al gavoa shomer ve'gavoa me'alehem, says Shalom Melech in Kohelet. And no matter how high the person is, um, Hashem is higher. And Hashem appoints the leaders, and Hashem leads our leaders, and Hashem knows exactly, or, or, or not, not just knows, uh, directs the path of the Jewish people at all times. So, Whatever the situation may become now different than it was before, it's all part of the process. You must believe that it's part of the process. Of course, everyone has to express their opinion. We're not saying to shut up and just accept. Of course, we should ex ex express our opinions. Each and every person, each and every party has to express their opinion. But the molding of all that together is really where we reach the truth of the, of, of the matter even if it doesn't seem to us so, because we think we have all the truth in us, that's totally incorrect. There's always room for other opinions and always room to learn from one another. Okay. Bezrat Hashem. Now, as we said before, uh, Dr. Weiss has just a question that can be a, uh, of interest to everyone. So, uh, Dr. Weiss will start with that question. Okay. Thank you for indulging me. Um, so this something that happened to me. I'm a little embarrassed, but you know, ain't have I shan lo made. So um, I was davening. I think it was mincha, and uh, it was rosh chodesh. It must have been shachris on Friday, rosh mm -hmm. chodesh. And uh, usually I'm a little mm -hmm. slower, and usually they start rep repetition of shmona. So I'm usually like in Allah tzadikim or vidur shalim bircha, something like there. And I noticed that mm -hmm. I was like in modim. And I said, oh, gee, I could, you know, I probably could make it to a Lakai Netzor and be able to at least answer to Kedusha. And I said, Yehula uh -huh. Imri Fi, I said that line. And then I thought to myself, and I'm waiting right. for them to say Kedusha. And then I said to myself, why is that I'm here so fast? And I realized that I forgot to say Yala Viyavo. Now, I know that if you haven't moved your feet yet, you can go back to Ritze and say, and say from there forward and say Yala Viyavo. 
My question was, Correct. should I be answering out loud to Kedusha? Is that more of a break in my Shemona Esrei that I should have not? So, so I didn't. I just sort of kept, you know, in my head, just was trying to be Shomaya Kaone and just went along. Mm -hmm. I was afraid that if I spoke, there would be too much of a break ending my Shemona Esrei and have to go back to the beginning. So was I correct? Or if you're in that paragraph, you can do what you want. Even if you, what if I'd already said, and then I remembered that I hadn't say Yalaviyavo. I answered Kadosh Kadosh before I said the second Yula Ratzon. In the very beginning, I said, I'm a Rechid of Maishal Bashalom, Yula Ratzon, Yimri Fi. Then said, Kainet right. Tolashani. And then I start answering to Kadusha. Uh -huh. And then it occurs to me before I say the second Yula Ratzon and move my feet, I remember that I hadn't said Yalaviyavo. So could I still go back or just somehow answering in that paragraph to Kadusha? break it too much. Wow, yeah, I understand the question. I'll just explain a little bit of the background and then we'll see if we can uh, evaluate the situation. I'm not, I, haven't, I don't recall having seen such a thing. So whatever I say now is Be'ravon uh, Mugbal, limited uh, uh, knowledge right now. And I have to maybe look this up uh, to, make, to make sure. But first I'll explain the basis of the question. Um, we'll start like this. If someone forgets, Yalav Yavo. By the way, if you weren't sure if you forgot or not, if you're within Shmone Esre contemplating, then we repeat. Because uh, it would be very uncommon not to remember within a few moments if you said it or not. If you said it or not. So if you're unsure, the problem is that we're not sure, so we probably did not say it. Because routine is not to say halaviyavo. We omit halaviyavo. We barely say it during the year. So the routine is not to. And now that uh, you, you don't remember, you're not sure with Inshmones, right after that, uh, until the end of, until the end of Elokai Nitzor, then it most probably means that you hadn't said it. Otherwise, you remember that you said it. If you're after, if you pass Shmones, right? If you know for sure you hadn't said it, then of course you repeat. If you're uncertain, when you're finished one esra, you're into hollow now. And suddenly you think, wait, have I said it, I said it or not? Then we don't repeat. That's what Shlomo Zalman says, we don't repeat. Because um, had it been true that you hadn't said, you may you probably would have, you had, you, you would have remembered before then, before uh, mid halal. When you're mid halal, then the Yetzirah sort of creeps in and starts making you unsure of yourself. Uh, unless you're certain you didn't say, then you don't repeat. Anyhow, um, so having forgotten, yale v'yavo, or even unsure, not 100% sure, but, with, but within the Shmona Esrei. So until you reach the second Yile Ratzon, which is after Lokai Nitzor, before Ose Shalom, if you said that, Hashem Tzuri v'go Ali, you finish that, even without taking the three steps back, that's considered the end of Shmona Esrei for you. At that point, if you remember, if you suddenly stop and if you suddenly realize that you hadn't said Yala Viavo, at that point, you do go back, you go back to the entire Shmonestri and you repeat, you repeat the entire Shmonestri. That's like having forgotten Yala Viavo uh, and you've already, after you've already finished Shmonestri totally, then you definitely have to repeat the entire Shmonestri. Okay, now, if you said the first Yula Ratzon, that is still considered in the midst of Shmonesre, which would mean that you only go back to Ritze, as Dr. Weiss said, you only go back to Ritze, uh, and from then on continue straight through with the Alev of course, this time, and, all, and repeat all the rest of the Shmonesre till the end. Now, at that point, if you re you've said the first Yilu Ratzon, and suddenly you remember you hadn't said uh, you're supposed to go back to Ritze. If the Tzibur happens to be in um, Kedusha, then at that point, anytime you're there, and uh, within a kind of tzor, anywhere between the two Yilorat zones, and you hear Kedusha, then you actually answer back, Kadosh, 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 and Mauch Vod. Without Imloch. You don't even say Imloch. And of course, without any of the uh, connecting uh, sentences, all those you don't say. Now, the moment one speaks within the Shmona Esre, within the Shmona Esre, that's an interruption that 
you cannot continue. You've ruined Shmon Esra. If you were to say hello to someone during Shmon Esra, just to say the word Shalom, one word, then you've interrupted the Shmon Esra in a way that you must can go back to the beginning because you mustn't speak any word within Shmon Esra. It has to be only the words of Shmon Esra. So now, Kedusha, is that considered, the fact that you answer back Kedusha, is that considered such an interruption that you can no longer back, go back to Ritzeh because it won't count for you as a full Shmon Esra because you've spoken in the middle. That's the question, okay? <clears throat> um, so firstly, I would begin by answering the following, that when a person isn't aware of the fact that by answering Kadosh, Kadosh, and Ma'uch Kvod, that may be an interruption, if it is an interruption. He thinks it's something that he must answer because he's in a spot in the Shmon Esher that you can say those two sentences. You should say them. And he didn't realize that this may cause an interruption in the Shmon Esher, and he said them, thinking that then he'll go back to Ritzet. So that's something that we learn um, uh, I, think I, can, I think it can be compared to, let's say by mistake, a person in Shvish uh, Pesach, Shvish <coughs> Pesach, making Kiddush uh, at, the e, uh, at the eve of Shvish Pesach. Uh, there's no Sheikh Yanu. There's no Sheikh Yanu because Shvish Pesach isn't a Chag Bifnat Smo, it's not its own holiday. It's connected to the rest of the days of Pesach. What happens if a person does say Shechianu then? He had said, he had said the Kiddush of Sheba Chabanu Mikol Am, Meroman Mikol Ashon, Mikidushal and so on and so forth. Baruch Atah Hashem, Mikadesh Yisrael Be'azmanim. And then before drinking meat like he should, he suddenly says Shechianu. Is that uh, an interruption uh, to the point where he has to repeat at least, well, only Baruch Atah Gafen actually? because uh, there's nothing wrong with his Kiddush. The Brach of Kiddush works for him. But the Rebbe Pratt got interrupted by saying that he should not have said. Same as if you would say uh, hello to a friend right after saying Rebbe Pratt before drinking, you have to repeat the Brach over again. Because you said a word that's not part of, uh, of, the, of, of, of Kiddush or of the Birka Sadeni that interrupts Birka Sadeni. So the answer to that is, says of Shlomo Zaman, when a person thinks that he's doing the right thing, he's unaware of the fact that it's wrong to say Sheikh Yano. And, that, and he says that anyhow, that's something that we can consider is not, that's not considered interruption. Because he thought it's meant, it's meant to be said, so there is a Tehese Chadat. The idea of speaking to someone in between the bracha and eating or drinking or in the middle of Shmon Esri, is Hesech Hadat. You're taking your mind off of the, uh, of what you're a part of, of, of what you're dealing with. And therefore, it's, uh, it's interruption. But if you don't think you're doing something wrong, then it's not interruption anymore. So if a person answers Kadosh, Kadosh, and Baruch Kvod, thinking that it's the right thing to do, then I would say it's not interruption because it's not a Hesech Hadat there. It's not something that... Uh, he thought he, it's meant to be said, so it could be uh, possibly uh, not, not, not interruption. Although we could say that there's a difference between the two cases, because by Barei Priya Gafen, he finished the entire bracha, or Barei Priya Eitz, and then he says a word to someone, or a word is definitely interruption, because he can't, there's no way a person would think that it's okay to, say, to do that. But he's saying Sheikh on the eve of, of Pesach, that could mean that uh, he thought it's that, that, that makes sense that he thought it's part of it and it's not interruption within the bracha it's between the bracha and the drinking or eating whereas here it's as if within the Shmon Esre it's like saying Shalom to someone and then of course then he wouldn't think it's, it's part of the bracha but okay you understand the difference. Um, so that's one thing to look up. So I'm not sure now exactly if it's, if he hadn't, if he thought he should have answered if that's considered a problem or not. And the other point 
Um, what came up to mind is that there's a machlokis uh, Rashi Tosfos whether um, we should be stop in the middle of Shmon Esre to listen to Kedusha. Shomea Keone, the fact that you're listening to Kedusha, it's Keone. It's as if you're saying it on your, on your own. And that's not allowed because you're saying it within the Shmon Esre. So I think it's Tosfos. I think it's Rashi who says Shomea Keone, you do stop. And Tosfos say no, because that's as if you're, say, you're answering the, the, the Kedusha and that definitely is wrong to answer Kedusha in the middle of Shmon Esrei out loud. So we pass it like Rashi that Shomer Kion is not quite as if you've said the words. Uh, what we see from this, obviously, that if you do say the words, it is an interruption. Everyone agrees that it's not allowed. Because Rashi says that Shomer Kion is not quite like saying the words on your own, so it's not such an interruption. Um, so here, when saying the words themselves, this proves that it's definitely interruption within the Shmona Israel. That's the other side of what we said before. And it may not be if a person mistakenly thinks he should answer. And on the other hand, if he, the answering itself is definitely interruption. Anyhow, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It's a very good question. I have to look this question up. Thank what you. I, yeah, from what I can assess right now from all this, it does seem like one should not answer to it, should not, and just listen, like you did. Like you did. Uh, that's what it seems like right now. And if by mistake they answered, not being aware that they should not have, they thought, that that's how one should do it, then a little bit, my leaning is a little bit towards uh, uh, Larry to go back to it, said that it's not considered interruption because he thought that's meant to be within the course of where he is, the spot he's in, and what he's meant to do. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe I'll check it up later on. Okay. Welcome. So let's go to, yeah, to the... Uh, Okay, we're starting a whole new chapter called Kibbutz, Laundering. Now, this, uh, <coughs> this is a one of the, actually, we're now entering, after doing so much of the preparation towards Shabbat, now for the first time we're entering, well, we spoke about a little bit, Hotzach, Nasa, by the Eru, uh, but uh, this is going to be the first Av Melacha, we'll be discussing. Uh, the, one of the 39 Melachos is Kibbutz, uh, laundering. Uh, so, first of all, uh, general lines, uh, uh, general issues that have to do with Kibbutz, and then we'll go into the actual case by case uh, uh, situations uh, from the book. Um, so, We'll do it like this. The, the definition of kibbutz, of laundering, is, well, it begins by melaben. Melaben was the fact that uh, they took the, um, when they needed to use the wool of the sheep uh, in order to create all the different uh, parts of the, Mishkan that called for uh, for wool or other uh, material to be used. So to clean it, that's melaben. To clean it uh, thoroughly uh, is melaben. That's the melacha. Now, all posts came hold that using water is melaben. That's the normal way to laundry, to, 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 to clean garments, is by use of water. Besides water, there's also shifshuf, or as the Gemara calls it, kiskus, that you rub the material one against each other, against itself, in order to get the stain out more thoroughly. Um, so those are two actions that have to do with kibbutz. Then 
there's also the question of the result of what you've done. The fact that it became clean or not. Did it remain somewhat dirty or it was clean thoroughly? That's another aspect to look at. We'll soon show how different posts, different Rishonim uh, discuss all these matters, but I'm just pointing out to these, to these situations. Now, there's also material that doesn't absorb water. It only stays on surface, like leather. Leather doesn't absorb water if you just pour it over it. If we pour water and rub one against each other, then yes, then it gets into the leather and then it works on the stain and then it can get it out. Of course, water isn't necessarily just plain water. We're talking about water and detergents and everything that's necessary in order to clean the garment. So, ah, so actually, as a matter of fact, in the Gemara, it does say that by leather, since water doesn't get absorbed into the leather, then in order for it to be kibbutz by leather, you must also do that second action. And besides pouring water, it's also rubbing. Only if you do both is it considered kibbutz by leather. But uh, Rabbi Yoshi, even Rav Vosner, Rav Karel, it's modern day post, can say that today we have very powerful detergents that all you need to do is spray them on the leather and they work on the, on the stain and get into it and, and, and clean out the stain. So even though what, applying water is not enough to be considered kibus by leather, by these, these detergents like uh, Economica, if it's, a, it's a white leather, if others and you have other detergents, uh, bleach or other detergents to get them out, to get the stain out. So that is considered kibus and without rubbing because it does the job. It does go into the leather, gets absorbed in the leather and gets out the stain from the, from the inside. So we're talking about any type of uh, material, any type of, 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 uh, of uh, applying anything onto the, onto the material that could get rid of the stain, that's where kibbutz comes along. What happens if you're cleaning a garment without applying anything? You're just rubbing one against the other dry surface, dry, everything is dry, you're just rubbing one against the other to get the dust out, to, get the clean, to clean the garment from dust. Or even more so, when you just shake the clothes and the dust comes off. <clears throat> so, ah, but before this, before this question, let's just make sure we understand the previous situation. Applying water over a garment of any type, except for the one that doesn't absorb the water, like leather, or in our days also plastic. Uh, synthetic material that doesn't absorb water, but uh, cotton, wool, uh, natural material uh, garments, those do absorb the water just by applying the water onto them. And that's what we call shriato zeokibuso, by the fact that it's, uh, uh, that it's, uh, um, uh, soaked in water, when you, soak, when you soak it in water without even rubbing anything and without any other detergents, that itself is kibbutz. By applying water, that's according to all Rishonim, and that's halacha lemaise, shriato zeu kibbutzo. Applying water doesn't have to be soaked in water. Even if you just pour a little bit of water onto a stain, that's already called shriato zeu kibbutzo. That's true, even if it doesn't get the stain out totally. The fact that it remains still doesn't mean you haven't done kibbutz, because you've laundried, you've cleaned a certain part of it. And that certain small part of it is already kibbutz, so you've done kibbutz. So that's definite. Now, rubbing one against the other, rubbing the surface with your hand or with any uh, uh, utensil, you rub the surface in order to get something out without applying water. So that is definitely an Issa de Rabbanon, Issa de Rabbanon of Kibbutz. Since you're not applying water, so it can't really 
get the dirt from inside, get it out from inside. So the rubbing itself is rabbinically forbidden. On any dry surface, you mustn't rub one against the other, rub it with a... Uh, actually, by use of a towel, dry towel, that you, that you rub against, uh, against the, uh, the, the clothing you want to clean, the material you want to clean, uh, would that be considered shifshuf? Uh, that's interesting. Because the, fact, the, the way the halacha expresses shifshuf is you're rubbing it against each other, the two sides of the garment, and not by rubbing by uh, using, a, uh, using a, dry, uh, uh, a dry cloth to rub the, the clothing you want to clean. Um, yeah, that most probably would not be considered brilliantly forbidden. Why? Because why is rubbing considered brilliantly forbidden? Because rubbing is part of, is done normally after applying water, it's done normally when you do laundry. You also rub. So if you just rub, uh, with that, applying the water, so it's only rabbinically problematic. That's, uh, uh, that's the reason it's really rabbinic, because it's, because it's, uh, it connects to the action of kibbutz. So you may go and then apply water as well. It's like xera, or it's a part of the kibbutz that uh, alone isn't uh, considered the real essence of kibbutz, because you're not uh, getting the stain out from within inside, but it does something. On the other hand, if you just take a towel, rub it against the, clo the clothing, that's something that's not necessarily done when you do normal laundering. Normal laundering is the garment itself absorbed in water and some other detergents and rubbing it against itself. Uh, Yeah, although I'm not 100% not, not sure because you would also take a towel and wet it. On a weekday, you would wet the towel and rub against clothing to get it out. Okay, that's interesting. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, every time we learn the halacha, we always find a new question, a new situation. Is rubbing a different, uh, a separate cloth on the clothing, dry, not wet, of course, dry over dry, is that considered like shifshuf, like iskus, which will be rabbinically forbidden, or not, it's totally okay. No, let me check one second, I find here, in Shin Bet, in the Shulchan Aruch itself. And he talks about Shifshuf. Shifshuf Tzido. No. I thought I would see it uh, immediately on the spot. I don't see it. Okay, so I have to look that one up too. Um, that's considered uh, brilliantly forbidden when it's a dry cloth, dry towel, and you're rubbing it against your clothing. Okay, I have to check that one. Interesting, that's commonly done. 
uh, not necessarily on Shabbos, I mean, normally during the week, although with water, maybe without, it would be in a Siddur Actually, it seems to be more so that way right now, but I have to check it out. Okay. Um, so this, this is the right level. Applying water, even just applying some water on the garment is already the right by leather or anything that doesn't absorb synthetic uh, gar garments. Only if you apply water or other, with, other, with other cleaning elements and rub, only then it's kibus uh, deoraita. Uh, if it's detergents that can get absorbed, uh, get absorbed into the leather and get out uh, the stain, then that itself is like deoraita, is deoraita like water uh, in other garments, in garments that do uh, absorb the water and get clean from it. Oh, Rav Steinberg, if I could yes. just say one thing. Yeah. Bleach does not, with detergents lift the molecules of the staining element, I don't know, oil or whatever it is, out of the garment. That's cleaning it. Bleach okay. does not do that. Bleach simply colors everything white. It's like taking a white marker and, and rubbing over it. You haven't actually uh -huh. removed the, uh, the molecules that are causing the stain. Now, that may be still a problem because in the end, you're getting something that looks white that was dirty before. Clean. But it's not the same right. kind of action. Aha. Uh -huh. Very nice. No, it's interesting. Very interesting point. That's why you mustn't apply bleach to anything but white cloth. Exactly. Other things that are called non-chlorine non bleach uh, bleaches, uh, like you'll see some you can buy in the store, they have what's called non, uh, they, they have a different kind of bleach. It's nothing to do with, there. there's something called optical whiteners. It's not important for now what that is. But there are bleaches, however, that do purposely contain detergent in them. So some of the bleaches that you buy for the, to do the floors are not gonna contain detergent. But the ones that are made for laundry will be a combination. It's not just pure chlorine bleach. So it depends whether you're applying pure chlorine bleach, which only will whiten, or chlorine bleach, which has detergent in it, which also will pull out some of the molecules of the dirt. So it depends uh -huh. on what you're using. Interesting, very interesting. So I would say, according to this, well, if it has detergents in it, then it's obviously kibbutz. You're obviously laundering besides coloring it white because it does that, has that effect that it gets out this, this stain. Um, if you're doing, a, if it's just coloring it white, then I would say it's sauvé actually. Even though it looks awkward, it seems awkward to say that because um, chemically, I understand what you're telling us. That's what it does. It just colors it white, and therefore you don't see the stain anymore. On the other hand, it looks to us as if the cloth itself got cleaned out from the stain. That's what it seems to us. So in any case, it's either Sovea or kibbutz. In any case, it's the Oraita. No matter this way or that. But it seems to me as if uh, Poskin would identify uh, even, even the uh, cleaning of uh, the way the bleach works, the simple bleach without detergents, would still identify that with kibbutz, because that's what we see in our eyes. In our eyes, we see that the garment is now clean from the stain. It doesn't look doesn't appear to us as if we're, we're coloring with a marker, uh, white, uh, uh, going over the stain with, uh, as if we're coloring it white. So I would still say that uh, we go by what our eyes see, what we can detect humanly without the uh, depth of uh, uh, science and, and, and technology. Okay, so... So that's uh, the right to the Rabbana. Now, I was going to say, uh, I interrupted myself before by speaking about, uh, and I started speaking about a situation where you're just shaking off some dust from the garment. What would that be considered? So on one hand, you're not doing a melacha that uh, has to do with kibbutz, with laundering, because you're just shaking the garment. That's not something you normally do in order to laundry something. You either apply water and other detergents or you rub one against the other. But just by shaking, that's how we clean normally our, our, our clothes. 
or any material, tablecloths, whatever, uh, anything that has, uh, that you just want to air out the dust, that's not a, a normally considered as laundry. On the other hand, if we get it clean from that dust, then after all, we've cleaned the garment. So after all, we, the chorus seems like we've done kibus. So for this, we need to learn another uh, concept in kibus before we get to the answer of dust, about dust. And that is the question whether something that's external to our, to our clothes, it's on top of our clothes, it's not at all absorbed in the clothes. For example, you have a feather that fell from the sky onto your shirt or, or jacket or pants while you're, work, while you're walking to shoulder back. Can you shove off that feather from your sleeve, from your shoulder, from wherever it fell? The answer is yes, you can. How come? Because this didn't get absorbed in any way. It didn't get uh, involved in the material. It's external totally to the material. It's on top of your shirt, on top of your garment, on top of your clothes, and not in any way absorbed in. But that's not kibbutz at all. It's so external that it's not considered that your, your clothes is dirty. It's, it's, it's something that's on, it's only on top, only external, and not dirty your garment itself. The material of the garment is not dirty. It's something on top of it. I'm thinking about it now, like, uh, uh, like I, thought, I thought of a situation where a person has anything over his clothes. He has a uh, knapsack or, uh, or a coat on top of his clothes, whatever coat, that's not dirt. But uh, it's as if it's that. It's as if his, his shirt is covered with something. It has over it another thing. And you're removing that other thing that's on top of the shirt. So that's fine. Problem is that dust does get semi-absorbed into the clothes, into the material. Maybe the layer, a very top, top layer of the dust, maybe is really like the, maybe could be considered like the uh, feather. But most of the dust, or a large part of it, is absorbed in the garment. Uh, proof of the matter is, when you just shake it a little bit, it doesn't fall off. You have to shake it very heavily, a lot of force, or a pat on it, give it some pats, or rub one against each other, or use water. All these methods get out the dust, but not just by shaking it. Whereas the, uh, le- the feather that fell on, on, on your clothes, just very shake it, shake it lightly and it falls off. So on this, on this, uh, by dust is a very, very huge machlokis. Because what's the question here? When we rub it against each other or pat on it or shake it very, very firmly and we get the clothes clean and it's absorbed, we said, as I said before, it's absorbed in the, in the uh, material, then you're actually laundering. The, the final product is now clean. So you've reached the final goal of making it your, your, your clothes clean, which is laundry. On the other hand, you haven't used any of the methods we, any of the methods we spoke about before. No water detergents and no rubbing one against each other, which would be rabbinic. Not doing this nor that. You're just shaking. Very firmly, okay. Adding it. Maybe blowing on it. Blowing on it to get everything fly off of it. But these aren't actions of kibbutz. That's, how not, that's not how you normally laundry, do your laundry. So uh, this huge dispute. Rashi. There's some background noise. Sorry. Okay. Rashi states in Sarah Shabbos Mem Zayin and 47a, Rashi says that there's actually chiv deoraita. Very, very stringent Rashi there. Chiv deoraita for airing out, for shaking uh, garments from dust, even without applying water and even without rubbing. 
is shaking from dust. It's a deraita. Very stringent. Whereas Tosfos quoted Rabbeinu Hananel, there are those that say it's Rabbeinu Tab, but uh, it was fixed to Rabbeinu Hananel. Rabbeinu Hananel, who holds that no way, that's not the writer at all. It even could be permissible to an extent to do that according to Rabbeinu Hananel, because you haven't done anything that is the action, normal action of kibbutz. Laundering. It does the job by airing it, by shaking it very strong. It does the job. It gets, it gets rid of the dust, but it's not the normal way of kibbutz. You're not doing any melacha of kibbutz. Why would Rashi say that it's doraita? Because from this we learn that Rashi holds that it's the result that we care about. The result is that it's all clean by doing an action of shaking, and we got it totally clean. That's the uh, understanding of kibbutz. And it's absorbed, something that's absorbed in the, in the, in the material. Whereas Rabbeinu Hananel speaks about, uh, understands the idea by the action you're doing. And the action is not an action of kibbutz. Whether it's not allowed rabbinically, forbidden rabbinically, according to Rabbeinu Hananel, that could be. By the way, the way he learns that, the Gemara that Rashi is based on Amenera Talitom in Afar Chayav Chatat, the Mizayin Amud Aleph, Rabbeinu Hanana learns that it's talking about not dust, it's talking about dew, tal, that there is a droplets of dew on the garment and you're airing, out, airing it out, uh, shaking it to get off those droplets of dew. That's what it's talking about there, and that's water. So by water, we hold that it is considered, uh, even that little bits, those little bits of droplets, even that's considered water that is, is part, is, is the melach of kibbutz, because even applying a little bit of water, you mustn't on Shabbat. Um, and this is all in cases where a person is makbid, um, meaning, he cares a lot that the garment, that his clothes should be clean. He normally, not just now for Shabbat, when he wants to go out and some dust on his pants or on his hat or on his jacket, he wants to get rid of it. But normally, he wouldn't go out to the street with that on. The Gemara discusses that it's only if it's a new garment and only if it's black. Uh, but in, in the end all, a case uh, in our days, it depends how people, uh, how much people care about cleanliness. And today we're much more uh, uh, clean looking than others. Now in those days, so that should be okay. So, so that's problematic uh, in our days from all types of clothes, not Dafka, the ones that the Gemara discusses. Um, The Mishamur just notes that, uh, ah, so I'll just say how, how the Allah is here. The Shulchan Aruch goes by the Rabbeinu Hananel. He says, He specifies that it's this garment that has dew on it and not just dust. And on that chayav, that's this the writer to shake. Okay. Um, and of course, according to all opinions, if there, there's some water uh, fell, uh, you got wet from, from, from rain, let's say, or fell into some water, the, the clothes, you definitely should not shake it off because by shaking off, you're removing the water and the water takes with it a stain if there were, may be. Ah, we haven't had discussed if, if the garment to begin with, it's clean. What happens then if we have an issue of laundering or not? That's a whole other discussion. We'll get to that uh, soon. Um, I just want to see if he discusses according to... Oh, here. 
uh, it's the Bir Alacha. The Ramah, the Ramah holds like Rashi. He says, Yes, Omrim, the Asuna begged me now, Vakshalav, Imak Pidah, Vitola Hushid Varav. The Ramah quotes Rashi that says, No, you mustn't even air out, shake out, shake off uh, um, uh, dust, even dry dust from a, from, 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 from a garment. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's uh, according to Rashi, it's to the right hand. The Ramah says, Tobla Hushid Varav. We should be careful not to even air out uh, uh, dry dust. Now, says the Bureau Lacha, Basham is Shona Remad, the Dari Shona, the Mefashi Binyan and the Ubetal, laid by a few is Sora. It sounds from the language of the Rama that there are those who say that it's not permissible to shake off dust and we should. Go by that opinion, we should accept upon ourselves that stringency, says the Ramah, says the Biralacha, it sounds like the first opinion doesn't even have an issue at all with it. Not even rabbinically forbidden. That's what I thought before. Uh, so the Ramah He says like this, fine conclusion. It's semi called Z. The Fira Data Matirim, the Shulchanor who allows a dry substance to air out, to shake away without applying any water, he allows doing so. Only if you're shaking, as we said before. Right, so he says, that's what he said before exactly. If you even dry surface without applying any water or anything else, no detergents, it's dry, but rubbing one against another, that even the first opinion agrees that we should not do that rabbinically, rabbinically forbidden. That's how he said before. So just airing, so it's amazing. It's a opposite, two sides, two opposite sides on, uh, of the machlokas here. On one side, we see Rashi and the Ramah quoting him and telling us to be, Careful not to do so, that it's an isodoraita to just shake off dust from our clothes. On the other hand, we have the Shulchan Aruch going by the Rabbeinu Hananel saying that it's permitted to do so. How much permitted? So, an isodorabanon if you rub against each other. That's rubbing it is an isodorabanon. Again, I have to check the fact of doing it with a towel. It's not. Uh, rubbing, what would be then? Uh, actually, I see here that Shlomo Zaman allowed uh, with the hand to throw it, I mean, he didn't allow, he said this according to the Shulchan Aruch. According to the Shulchan Aruch's opinion that just shaking is not an issue, only if you're rubbing, he thought that if you push it away with your hand, Lightly, the Yad Rakah, the Yad, lightly uh, pushing it away, uh, that's uh, permitted according to the Shulchan Aruch. And others say, no, that's called Chief Shuf already. Ah, so I would say like this this solves our issue. This solves our issue because we're talking about our hand that is pushing away throwing off the dust from our, from our begging. And that's a dispute between post scheme if it's considered a shoe for not. So definitely if we're using a towel that we strongly rub against, against our garment, that would be like shif shuf. That would seem to be like shif shuf, which, which would be rabbinically forbidden. Anyhow, according to Rashi, it definitely is not allowed because if you get rid of the of the uh, stain totally or, 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 or the dirt totally by the dirt that's absorbed again. Don't forget, it's not crumbs. Crumbs that are on top of our shirt or jacket, that's no problem to, to, to throw off because that's not absorbed in the garment. That's okay. We're just talking about absorption. I mean, that's absorbed, that's closely in, internally connected to the garment. That's the key. 
So if we do that with, uh, with a towel and we get out what's a little bit absorbed like dust with a towel, according to Rashi, of course that's not allowed. That's just a right because we got it clean. According to the other post, to the Shulchan Aruch, on that side, where they say if it's, if it's just uh, shaking, it's okay, but rubbing is not. And even if we call even with our hand to rub, some posts can say that it's already the prohibition of rubbing. And Shomu Zaman says, no, if you do it lightly, but definitely if you rub strongly with a towel, that's not allowed. Rabbinically, according to Shulchan Aruch, they're right, according to Rash. Now, one last point in this area. If you're just rubbing, one against each other, as, or as you said, with a towel, that's also considered rubbing, if you're just rubbing, and the stain hasn't gone out totally. You just got a little bit more, uh, a little bit less uh, obvious. Not distinguishable as easy as it was before, now it's a little bit more uh, light. But it was just by rubbing without using water. In this case, it's totally allowed. Going to all posts, both sides. Why is it totally allowed? Because let's do the calculation. Let's start with Rashi, who's more stringent than even dry uh, stains or, or um, uh, more so dirt, dry dirt absorbed in the garment. They're right to level. That's only true even by just shaking it, definitely by rubbing. That's only true if you got rid of the dirt totally. But if it's still there, and you don't have the result of laundering, because it's still dirty, and you haven't done the action of laundering, because you've just aired it. So now, ah, but in our case, you did the rubbing. You did some rubbing, but it didn't get the stain out. Ah, so it goes like this. Yeah, I forgot to mention. It goes like this. The Gemara says in Kuf Mem Aleph, the other one's Kuf Mem Zayn. Sorry, it wasn't Mem Zayn. Kuf Mem Zayn, the one with the uh, dust versus dew. And the one in Kuf Mem Aleph, the Gemara says that if you're rubbing it normally, meaning you're, you're doing it from taking the two sides from outside and rubbing one against each other, or using the towel and rubbing it very firmly, that's still Nisad de Rabbanan, even if you don't get the uh, staying out totally. Because that's, because that's the action that rabbinically is considered an action of hibus. You didn't apply water, so it's not the oraita, and you haven't gotten the dirt to stay out totally, so it's not that problem with Rashi, that if you get it totally clean, it's the oraita, it's only rabbinic, but if you do it as it's done normally, meaning rubbing it from the outside, that's it's the Durabanan to do so, no matter how much of the stain goes, goes away. Because you're doing the action of kibus. And then you may apply water and all that, zera. But if it's, um, but if you want to take the garment from inside, you stick, like this, sticks your hand, you stick your hand in under this clothing and rub it from inside like this, then you're doing a shinui. You're not doing it normally, as normal, which is rubbing from the outside piece to piece or, 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 or with the towels rubbing strongly. So that shinui allows you to do it totally. That's not a way of kibbutz at all. That's a reminder. What was the whole gzera? That you may apply water. Now that you're doing it different than normal, that's a reminder for you that it's Shabbat You're not going to do it normally. So that's why that's allowed. Providing, this is a very important uh, uh, condition, providing you don't get this, this, the dirt or the stain off totally by doing so. The moment you get the stain off totally, then you enter this, situa- this problem of uh, Rashi is speaking about the fact that you get the, that you, in the end result, end all result was that you got the garment clean. You got it clean. You can't, uh, that's a the right to level you, sir. Maybe because it didn't be shino, it would be rabbinically forbidden. But it would definitely be forbidden 
because you've got the dirt out totally, it's a clean garment now. So um, those are different uh, concepts. If we summarize quickly, very, very short summary, we'll say like as following. When the garment is a type that does not absorb water as you apply it onto it, like leather, like synthetic, then just applying water is not a problem. You're allowed to apply water on those types of materials, but you mustn't rub, apply water and rub one against each other. That gets the stain out uh, totally, and that's not allowed. Or as we said, to rub with a external cloth on it, that's also rubbing in the end. If it's a garment that does absorb, then even just by applying water without any rubbing, without any scrubbing, nothing you're doing, to it, just applying water, that's not allowed according to all post scheme, material that absorbs water. Then we went down to this lower level of just scrubbing without water, where we said normally that's an isodurabanon, rabbinically forbidden, because it's the within, it's, it's, it's part of the process of cleaning, but without water, it's not considered really clean. But it's xera that you may apply water. And, um, and according to Rashi, if you get the stain totally clean or the, uh, the, the dirt totally off, then it's an isodorite no matter what. Even if you're just scrubbing, or even just airing it, just shaking it, and it all goes off, and it's a deraita. The Ramah says to follow Rashi, to be careful not to do so. The Shulchan Aruch not. So for Shulchan Aruch, it would be allowed just to shake off. Just to shake off uh, uh, dust would be allowed to rub, scrub something that would get the dust off. That itself is a nisa even if it doesn't get totally clean. But if you do it awkwardly, bishinu, from the inside and rub against each other, then that's allowed as long as it doesn't it totally clean, according to the Ramah, and then it's a problem. Okay, so these are the different ways uh, of, of laundering. Now, there are two other concepts that uh, we haven't touched on them. One is what happens if it's a clean garment? Can you then pour water over it, although we may not understand why we would do such a thing. Why would, you, why, why, why would you apply water onto a clean garment? That's something that's not so uh, necessary usually, but we'll discuss different situations where it is done. Uh, I'll just throw to you the idea of wiping your hands on a towel, wet hands on a towel that uh, seemingly is this situation. If the towel is clean, then you're applying water on a clean uh, cloth, clean uh, material. Is that considered kibbutz or not? Uh, and then there's also a concept called derech lichluch. The fact that we, we're not applying water in order to, to service us and clean the clothes, then quite the opposite. The water is sort of dirtying the clothes, which takes us back to the towel. Uh, when we dry our hands on a wet our wet hands on a towel, we're just dirtying the towel, not cleaning it, even though we're applying water on the garment. So that's another concept. And, uh, and there's a whole issue of Shema Yishat. All that we spoke about water without water and all that, that's the laundering process itself. But there's Xera, rabbinic Xera, and even in cases where applying water or uh, causing something to be soaked with water the, it would not be an issue of kibbutz for some reason. We haven't learned yet those concepts of beged naki or derech clean garment, or in a way that just dirties the garment. But in any case, that, that would be permissible. There's another issue to take into consideration. Shema yishat. And if you have something that's soaked in water, you may go and squeeze it out, wring it out. And schita is definitely an issue of kibbutz. That's one of the actions of kibbutz. How do we do laundry? 
after applying water, detergents, rubbing, scrubbing, all that, you need to wring it out. You need to squeeze it all out. And the squeezing out is also part of the process of cleaning it. So even if the applying the water wasn't an issue, or even if it just got wet on its own, uh, some clothes that's outside and, and, and it started raining and got wet, there's a problem of even lifting it. Shema Yitzchak, you may go and squeeze it out. And by squeezing, you're definitely doing melechet kibus. That's part of the melacha of, of laundry. That's another issue to uh, discuss uh, within uh, the general outline, guidelines of this melacha. So that's about it uh, as an introduction. Um, as we go uh, and discuss case-by-case -case situations like we normally do, so you'll, we'll review, every time we'll review the concept that's related to that case, refresh our minds, and also we'll see how all this comes to practicality. Uh, if I could ask, I guess we'll get to this yes. later. How does meat asik factor into this? Because if I'm wearing clothes that happen to have a stain on it, and I'm out for lunch and I got a stain in my shirt, what can I do? Now it's raining yeah. and I don't want to walk home. So do I have yeah. to protect the stain? Uh -huh. I need to make sure we're walking out the rain and we're to get home after walking out to laundry. Is that a plot? Yeah, I heard you a little bit uh, unstable, but I heard, I think I heard your question. Uh, Dr. Weiss is asking if you have a stain on, on your shirt and you're invited while you're, while you're hosted by someone and you have to go back home and it's raining, is that an issue of kibbutz? You have to protect the stain that it should not get laundried by clean that, clean the, clean the way by the rain. So actually, I'll tell you something amazing. Uh, Rav Nevenzal asked even a, asked even a, 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 a more sort of uh, unbelievable question than that. Rav Nevenzal asked the question, how come one can leave their home or leave shul while it's raining? Because we, as I mentioned, there are different opinions. What happens if the clothes is clean and yet you apply water to it? And I, I didn't say exactly what the Allah is in the Shulchan Aruch. It seems like he holds by the lenient opinion that if the clothes is clean and there's water applied to it, or one applies water to, uh, uh, onto the clean garment, it's not a problem, kibbutz. Well, it's probably rabbinically would be a problem, but not deoraita. Whereas the Ramah goes by the more stringent opinion that if you apply water even to a clean garment, that's still kibus, Because it's the action that counts here. Unlike what we said in the name of the Ramah, uh, shaking off uh, the um, dust, we said that the final result is the kibus. So it goes both ways. Whether applying water itself is considered kibus even if it's a clean garment, or uh, shaking, to reach the final point where it's completely clean, that's also considered kibbutz. Anyhow, so Rav Nevin tell us, according to, according to, um, to the Ramah, that even if it's a clean garment, you mustn't apply water. So how can we do, leave our homes when it's raining? And believe it or not, he doesn't have an answer. He couldn't come up with an answer why one should not be able to leave the house while it's raining. So definitely, if there's a stain on a dirty garment, then definitely according to all post scheme applying water is at the right level of melacha. How could it be that it is, uh, ha ha can, can we leave the house or, or, or the place we were staying at uh, without protecting the stain, letting it uh, get clean? Um, no, so I, I had a thought uh, a few years back that uh, maybe the answer to Revenzal's question of why, how come one can go out in the, in, in, while, while it's raining, at least in point of view of laundering, we speak about derech lichnuch. As I said before, you apply water in a way that's just dirtying it, like wipe, uh, drying your hands on a towel. So you're applying water in the towel, but just in a way that's dirtying the towel and that should be permitted a 
according to all poskim. We, we, there's a bir halacha that discusses whether it's true according to all poskim, but uh, but uh, the, his final conclusion, although it leaves a bit sarachiyun, but the final halacha is that applying water in the way that is dirtying the garment is definitely allowed. So I would say when a person goes out in the rain, they're completely not interested of their clothes getting wet. It's against what they really need or want. So it's derech lichluch, which is allowed. Problem with this, uh, Dr. Weiss's question was that actually the, the spot in the spot of the stain, you do benefit from it. It's not derech lichluch. There, it's really cleaning your clothes. So there, that's something that could be more problematic. It's not considered derech lichluch. Unless we see it as a general uh, outcome of rain. General outcome of rain, it's bad for us. It's not something we're, delight, we're delighted with. It's not something we enjoy. It's just dirtying us. Well, doesn't it say help you also? I guess so also, right. Um, Yeah, by the mere fact that you're just walking. You want to use the Ravosner's idea of uh, lights that go, that go on, as we mentioned many times. That are, exactly. Are, right. Because you're just walking. Yeah, although Rav Levinsal definitely did not see it that way. If he asked the question, how can you go out in the rain? Um, uh, it's interesting because he speaks about the fact it doesn't matter if you bring the garment to the water or the water onto the garment. He says no difference. You're doing the action of wetting your clothes either way. But here you're just walking. And it's happening as you're walking. Yeah, that's also a good idea. I think it's also a good idea. He may not, Nevinsal may not have accepted this whole idea of Vosner of that type of itasic that's allowed. But if we go by that Ravosner's opinion, then that could also be a good idea to solve the issue of mitasik. Yeah, because you're just walking. I would say, I would say the following. If you walk purposely to a place that has water streaming down, and you purposely want to get yourself wet in order to clean something, that's definitely the action already, even though you're just walking. Uh, but it's really for your benefit. That's what Ravosner said, that that could be an Issa de Rabbanon, uh, even though you're just walking, but on purpose, deliberately, you want to, by walking, uh, activate something and make it uh, work on Shabbat. So that's, that's at least rabbinically forbidden. Here it could be the right even because, like we said before, it doesn't matter if you bring the clothes to, it's a way of bringing the clothes to the water. It's much worse than electronically walking by something and it opens up that we said just walking isn't a malacha, but if you're walking towards it and want it to open, then it's rabbinically forbidden. Here it's much worse. It's a, you see, it's the entire action of laundry. You see the water, you see your garment and you're walking towards the water on purpose to get it wet. That's definitely the right level. That's the right level. Here, you're walking out to shul or back home and getting wet on the way. You're not doing something deliberately to get yourself, to get the clothes wet. So this I can more accept that it's like that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Would there be a if you have a whether, well, whether you want on, to get wet, or don't want to get wet, forget your clothes in. Let's say it's a hot day and you see that somebody's garden sprinkler is on. Now, you don't want to get your clothes wet. You want to get you wet. You want your face to get the nice splash of cool water to cool you down. Incidentally, of course, if your face gets wet, probably your clothes are going to get wet. So it's not like so in the rain. In the rain, I don't want to get wet at all. Right. Here, I don't want to. You didn't need it. You got cut off again. Okay. Do I want to get my clothes wet? That's not where I'm going. The one place I don't want to get wet at all 
the other case I need a wet but not a close. It's just incidental that the clothes get wet. Yeah, but that yeah, maybe it's better. What was there a difference between walking in the rain? I don't want to get wet. Yeah, so or walking past a sprinkler. Yeah, it's hard to hear your question exactly, but I'll repeat what I heard. Um, when you're walking by, I want to get wet. I just don't yeah, yeah, it's the problem with the line, uh, Dr. Weiss. Is the problem with the internet line? So let me just send, answer what I understood. Walking in the rain, you don't want anything to get wet, not yourself, not your clothes. Walking by a sprinkler, not just by a sprinkler, rather towards a sprinkler in order to get your face wet, but uh, evidently it's going to get your clothes wet as well. You're not interested in the clothes getting wet, you're just getting wet. No, but that's for sure concern. Secretia. Maybe secretia de lo nichale, but that's secretia. Because you're going deliberately towards the water. So... Although you don't, your intent is not for yourself, for the clothes to get wet, but it has to happen. It has to happen is seek ratio. So that's not allowed rabbinically. It would be seek ratio de lo nichale. Rabbinically would not be allowed. Because uh, uh, there is a whole sugya. Let's, let's wait for next week. There's a whole sugya of nida me'arebet of tebelet bitgadea or makbi pnei rabo. There are sugyos in Shas that we see that a person can go into water actually because they're on the way to something, uh, to, their, to see their rabbi, and they go on the way into water. And uh, even though they get themselves wet because they're not interested at all in getting wet, they're going to do a mitzvah, to perform a mitzvah. Or Anita that goes into the mikveh, to, into water, when she has to have her clothes on for some reason. It's a airy, baggy clothes, and she gets the clothes wet as she's immersing in the mikveh. Uh, all these cases we'll discuss uh, again eventually because these are specific cases. It's, it's like a security a camera. It's like a security camera which you have to get to show. But you have to walk by the security camera and which is going to take pictures of you or it's clicked on. But you're still allowed to go through it because you're, you know, that's not your intention. Right. Right. That's the metastic we spoke about before. It's not yeah. just our intention. It's even... Yeah, it's, it's, it's more so the fact that you're just walking. There's no melacha by just walking. Yes. But, go, but it's different than deliberately going to a water fountain or a sprinkler and deliberately getting wet. That is the action. That is no difference if I throw the clothes into the water or apply water onto the clothes. There, we, we're actually doing the action of laundering. That's why it's worse. You're just walking by and a sprinkler happens to sprinkle on us water, that could be considered the same as the camera or the light being turned on. Right, that's the mitas. Okay, I think we'll stop with this. Zada should allow to clarify in so many cases uh, that we'll discuss case by case as we go ahead in the chapter and uh, discuss other concepts as well. Okay, call to... Thank you. Thank you. You too. Tough.